introduced a duo deck of cards. <laughs> Seriously? That has not 12 copies of every one of the cards. It's on one grade. Yeah, you can if you go. So instead of taking the road, if you go up, um, it's not safe. It's the first. Talking about Snodgrass. You go up the, the trail into Snodgrass, you can see the slopes back down to Rumble. Yeah. Or you can go up on the snow. Or you can just, like, we just ignored it in and spend the night at the cabin. At the cabin. There's two of them that they keep open yeah. around through the Nordic Center. And then, yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Um, was it Reed who put it on? Or who put it on? Uh, who hosted the uh, previous this year? So most of it was organized by Bill Bowman. It's Bill. Yeah. He's still, he's still active up there? Yeah. Same. Same. Yeah, he's still running like an RE program and all that stuff. Yeah, that's so let's see. So let's see, it's just about 12.30. So let's give people a couple more minutes. I know Christine is calling the guys. We have another snap here, apparently. Uh, so I'll keep you all posted as the <laughs> sandwiches uh, are supposed to arrive. Um, but we'll just give people just two or three more minutes to, to wander in before we start. I was taking intermission for sandwiches. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So our, our first week, the pizza people got lost, and they uh, they delivered with about ten minutes to go. So lunch was closed at seven hours, which is fine. We have some folks joining remotely. It looks like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, it's just it's just the it's screen. basically just the screen, yeah. All right, welcome everybody. Um, before I introduce John, uh, Christine just emailed me that Etai's delivery person is being contacted by catering. So uh, I ho I hopefully we will have lunch for you all. Um, so today's speaker is John Lovell. John did his uh, BA at CC, Go Tigers, uh, and his PhD in ecology from CSU up the road. Um, he did a visiting research assistantship at Appomixis Research Group Institute for Plant Genomics and Crop Plant Improvement and an NSF funded postdoc at University of Texas, Austin. Um, he's published quite a bit in several journals, including Molecular Biology and Evolution, Scientific Reports, Plant Physiology, PNAS, Proceedings B, um, and several more. John is currently a computational biologist at the Genome Sequencing Center at Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. And today he'll be talking to us about comparative genomics to uncover the drivers of environmental stress responses. So please welcome John. Uh, thanks, Scott, for the intro. Um, I'm going to try and keep track of time, but I don't see any clocks here, so if I start going oh, over, yeah, yeah, just let me know. Um, thanks, y'all, for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, be here. As Scott mentioned, I'm at uh, Hudson Alpha, which is um, uh, in Alabama, but I work remotely. I'm actually in Denver. I'm, I live in Arvada, and I work um, part-time downtown here and part-time out in Arvada trying to find like just offices that, uh, that suit me. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, my research in the genetics of adaptation. In particular, the how understanding how and why plants respond to environmental stress. So I'll be talk, focusing today on these two species. Uh, really didn't uh, represent well. This is switchgrass grown under a uh, rainfall um, uh, exclusion shelter. So for context, these plants are about six or eight feet tall, so this is a very large experiment. And then this is uh, the genetic model for switchgrass, Panicum hallei, and this is about four inches tall. So um, this is a, like, we use this as a genetic model to test hypotheses about switchgrass. So the reason that I study drought and um, environmental stress in plants is because plants are accessible organisms, right? They don't move around, they can't buffer their environmental conditions. And so there's actually very strong and uh, detailed literature about uh, climatic adaptation for plants because they must physiologically deal with any environmental stresses that may come across during their life history. Now this is not to say that I'm not interested in adaptation broadly. I mean, there's tons of examples of um, adaptation across stress gradients. Here's um, white versus dark sands and lizards. But these examples in animals are usually across very extreme gradients. In plants, adaptation to stress can be very subtle and very quantitative because environmental conditions vary continuously often. Maybe my favorite example of uh, adaptation is also the first example of local adaptation in plants, climatic adaptation in plants, done by uh, Clausen and colleagues back in the 40s at a Carnegie Institute. What they noticed, this is San Francisco down here, and this is the top of the Sierra Crest. What they noticed is that this species of Achillea was found across this massive 3,500 meter elevation gradient. And clearly the conditions at treeline are very different from the conditions at the coast, where there might be stresses like cold and heat, and a cold and high uh, light and, and other stresses at high elevation, there might not be at lower elevation. And they hypothesize that populations found at low elevation would do poorly at high elevation and vice versa. Now this sounds pretty straightforward, but this is the first example of what we call now local adaptation. And um, it's exemplified by this population found on the coast doing great in Stanford and not making it at high elevation. And vice versa, the high elevation population from here doing great at high elevation, 
and also surviving, but not producing nearly as high fitness as any of the other genotypes. This reciprocal home site advantage, this trade-off between genotype and environment is by definition local adaptation and is driven in plants very often by environmental stress. In this case, in part by the stresses associated with elevation. So in the 60 years or so since, or 70 years ago since this publication, we've done a lot of work to trying to understand the actual environmental factors that drive adaptation, as well as the genetic basis for these adaptive trait responses. Um, my, fav my favorite recent work comes from uh, my colleagues, Yoon Ogren and Doug Shemsky, where they grew, where they found that Arabidopsis thaliana has a geographic range that spans um, Europe, but its range margins are about the central coast of uh, Sweden and somewhere in south central uh, Italy. So they found stable, um, pretty genetically homogeneous populations at both of these range margins and reciprocally transplanted them. And like Clausen and colleagues, they found massive home site advantage. Here black is the Italian genotype, white is the Swedish genotype, and you can see in Italy, the Italian genotype does the best, and in Sweden, the Swedish genotype does the best. This is very strong evidence for local adaptation. And um, during my post uh, during my dissertation, we followed up on this, trying to define the genes and environmental conditions that best captured the drivers for this local adaptation. Our initial hypothesis was that. Um, some of this adaptation, besides being driven by just latitude and changes in life and in growing season length, some of this is driven by Sweden being really wet and green when you look at it from like 10,000 feet, and Italy being very dry and brown. This, so we had this hypothesis that in Italy, plants are very drought stressed, and in Sweden, they're not. And so the Italian genotypes must be drought adapted, and the Swedish genotypes not, and that's in part what's causing this local adaptation. What we found was just the opposite. Um, instead, what we would expect here, this is two phenotypes, leaf water content and water use efficiency. What we would expect here is strong differences between wet environments and dry environments, where the water use efficiency increases dramatically in the dry environment. And what we see is instead that the Italian genotype here in red has no significant plasticity in water use efficiency or in leaf water content. Instead, it's the Swedish genotype that is acting in an adaptive manner. And this was surprising to us. We weren't sure exactly what was going on or why this <coughs> might be until we dug down a little bit more into the climate. So right here, this is the growing, this is the seasonal, um, a seasonal chart from January to December, in case you can't read it. The gray bars indicate the prevalence of drought. So the light gray is moderate drought, dark gray is uh, heavier drought. And what you can see here, this is the Italian site. What you can see is that it's really dry in Italy in the summer. If you've ever gone to Italy in the summer, you know it's beautiful, it's beach weather. But I go there all the time in the winter to collect tissue and it's always rainy, I've even gotten sleeted on, it's always rainy, cool, and cloudy. And it's in the winter that Arabidopsis thaliana grows. It's a winter annual, it germinates in the fall, grows vegetatively through the winter and flowers in the early spring in Italy. During this period in Italy, it's very wet. And so this is actually not a drought environment for Arabidopsis thaliana. Contrarily, in Sweden, it's very, um, it's very wet in the summer and in the winter, but those are two periods that Arabidopsis is not doing anything. It germinates in September and grows vegetatively in early fall. And then once snow falls, it goes dormant and then starts growing again in mid-spring. Those are two periods where drought is actually very prevalent in uh, Sweden. And so while we had initially thought that just that these habitats differed in drought, we were right just in the opposite way that we, we had expected. So the reason to study drought is not just because it's a driver of adaptation in nature. It certainly is. There's lots of studies showing that it causes speciation as well as local adaptation but also because drought is a major driver of agricultural productivity. This is the last, um, <coughs> sorry, this is the last 50 years or so um, of yield per acre. You can see a steady increase, that's because we've gotten better at growing plants and breeding plants. 
but many of these dips are associated with climatic anomalies, including drought. The largest reductions in crop yields that we see globally have to do with drought or blight, but in terms of abiotic responses, drought is the most strong factor of agricultural productivity. And this would be easy enough to deal with if we could just predict where drought was. If we knew that it's always dry in one area, we could breed for drought, constitutively drought tolerant genotypes, and that would be fine. But the problem is that we don't. This was earlier this year. The droughts were in the American Southwest. For the US, darker red means more extreme droughts. And not surprisingly, the Four Corners region had a very extreme drought. This is, of course, when all of those wildfires started down there. But six years ago, the situation was very different. And so if you're breeding for, let's say, growth in Missouri, and one year, well, sorry. One year it looks like this, where there's no drought, and the next year it looks like this, where there's very extreme drought. You have to make sure that your plants that you're growing can survive these. And this is particularly true in agriculture where we're not using irrigation. And I'll finish by driving home the point that drought is important because there are a lot of models showing that drought in North America is going to increase both in severity and recurrence interval. So this is at 2070, the predicted change in Palmer Drought Severity Index and two other measures of drought severity, and predicted change from current. Blue means that it's going to be wetter, or drought is going to be less prevalent. Brown means that it's going to be more prevalent. And you can see for sure most of the continental U.S. will experience more drought over the coming century. So studying drought uh, from a plant biology perspective is particularly important for my my current position because I work for the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, the, um, the Hudson Alpha Institute of Technology, where I work. We're a contractor and we build the genomes that Joint Genome Institute um, uses. And JGI has three particular goals. The first is obvious. They're trying to build um, biofuels. They're trying to understand how we can get greater biofuel yield from plants. That can be breeding or biotechnology. Um, they also want to understand the processes controlling greenhouse gas, both emissions and assimilation. And then they also want to know about the processes controlling biogenic geochemical cycling. These three goals may seem very disparate, but actually breeding for plants, in particular um, biofuel plants that are perennials, offer a way to synthesize these three goals. So these are the JGI flagship genomes. They span algae, early plants, dicots, and monocots. And what I work in is this group over here of C4 perennial grasses, especially Panicum virgatum switchgrass. And switchgrass not only is a biofuel crop that we can use to breed to produce biofuels, but also since it's a biofuel crop that uses CO2 in the air and assimilates it, it can actively, at a large enough scale, we can use it to control greenhouse gas accumulation. And finally, since it's perennial, the amount of <coughs> mineral nutrients input into the system is actually relatively low, and we can understand um, or better uh, control about the biogeochemical processes without so much fertilizer input. So today I'm going to be talking in particular about how we can understand drought um, responses in Panicum Brigadum and its relatives. Um, first, by generally studying molecular responses to plant, of plants to stress, and then digging down and looking at the regulatory variants that may, and the regulatory networks that respond to stress in, a rel in that relative of switchgrass, Panicum halii. And then finally, how we can use bioinformatics, computer programming, and whole genome sequence resources that we have available to us to find the regulatory variants that actually underlie these whole plant responses. All right, so let's get started. Um, so the species that I'm talking about, I've mentioned it before, switchgrass. Here's a diversity <coughs> panel of mature plants growing in six foot tall concrete cylinders. We grow them in here sometimes so that we can control the edaphic environments while allowing natural aerial environments. And you can see that this is a diversity panel grown in one gallon pots. You can see there's a tremendous amount of diversity in just in morphology. Light green to bluish green to dark green in terms of its chlorophyll content. Plants that grow quickly, 
ones that grow slowly, large leaves, small leaves, etc. So it's a great system because there's so much genetic diversity to work with. But it's also important to note that switchgrass has a massive geographic range. So this is where switchgrass grows in the, north, in the U.S. It also goes a little bit into Mexico and a bit up into the Maritimes. But um, dark blue here indicates um, rainfall of more than 1,500 millimeters a year, and brown indicates less than 500 millimeters. And we have accessions from across this um, rainfall gradient, including this little guy here that's found in South Dakota um, and is from a very dry habitat, particularly during the growing season. And this one here that's from more wet uh, northeast Texas habitat. And so we can use these genetic resources to test how plants differentially respond to drought. So um, before we actually dive down into the genetic basis of drought responses, I want to make a point. Um, as I showed earlier, drought is contextual, right? That for a Arabidopsis, it doesn't matter how dry it is in the middle of the summer. It only matters in early season or late season. Also, but also drought matters in terms of how we impose it experimentally. So we set forth to test how one genotype of switchgrass responds to three different types of drought treatments. One in one gallon pots, one in these cylinders that I was talking about earlier, and one in these, uh, this huge rainfall exclusion shelter. And these span very controlled laboratory conditions, um, controlled pedophics, <coughs> conditions in the soil, but natural aerial habitats, and then completely natural, both aerial and uh, soil habitats with just augmented rainfall. And the, oh, and the reason to do this is because we have lots of work in this system. This is something that a PhD student or a master's student could do in a year or two on limited funding, right? Plant some plants in one gallon pots, grow them up, stress them. This takes some more money, and this takes like two NSF grants. Right to do because this is huge experiments. We want to make sure that we're modeling drought responses between these simple experiments and as the experiments get more complex. We want to make sure that we're doing a good job of modeling. So for each of these experiments, what we did is we went out, collected leaf level physiology, in particular leaf water potential, which tells us how dry is that plant, how hard is that plant holding onto that water. And at the same time, on that same leaf tissue, we collected gene expression. So we have a, um, really talking about now. So we have a uh, three prime tag RNA seq approach that allows us to do gene expression uh, assays for about $15 a sample. Um, that's in contrast to total RNA seq, which is something like $400 or $500 a sample. So this allows us to have the same type of replication in gene expression as we would other quantitative traits. So, what do the results look like? So these are the three experiments. The greenhouse, which is that grown in one gallon pots, the cylinders grown in, out in the, the tall standing cylinders, and in the shelter experiment just for one year, uh, for two years, excuse me. Um, but we have many more years associated with it now. And this is the physiology. So this is stomatal conductance, how open are the stomata in the plant's leaf, and pre-dawn leaf water potential. For the cylinder and the shelter, we also collected midday leaf water potential. So that's another <laughs> indicator of uh, basically stomatal conductance and leaf water potential are linear or are related in a very predictable manner. So we can see from these three experiments is that the greenhouse, we elicited the strongest drought. These plants down here are very, very dry. I guess that's because it's easier to dry out a one gallon pot than it is a big cylinder or the field. The other, the shelter experiment has the second most dry um, drought treatment and the cylinder the least dry. But in all of the experiments, essentially we had very similar wet treatments, where they all, all of the wet treatments had very little um, drought stress. And so we expected, given these similar physiological responses to drought, we expected similar gene expression responses to drought. And we did not find this. So the way to read this, these are called volcano plots. Um, each dot represents one gene. The p-value on the log 10 scales on the y-axis and the difference between wet and dry, the log scale difference between wet and dry is on the x-axis. So these points over here are significantly more expressed in the dry treatment than the wet, and vice versa, more expressed in the wet than the dry. And these gray points down there, those are not significantly differentially expressed. What you can see from these plots 
is that the gene expression plasticity is much, much stronger in the greenhouse on a cylinder than it is in the field. That when we're saying that there's a difference between wet and dry in the greenhouse, we're finding many, many more differentially expressed genes than we would in the field. This was really concerning because we're trying to use these experiments to model this experiment. So we're not finding similar patterns at the genetic level. What might be causing this? Well, what might be causing the fact that we see similar physiological responses in very different differential expression? Well, the first hypothesis that was raised by reviewers is that, oh, we all know field is just noisier than the greenhouse. It's harder to control the conditions. And um, I'm not going to show the data, but I can tell you right now that that's actually very wrong. The, we had far more variation in the greenhouse than we did in the, the field. And that makes sense, actually, think about it. It's much harder to um, have one little pot be the same exact water potential as, an, as another pot, but it's much easier to have a huge amount of soil that's buffered by all, by all of the conditions in the huge root system. It's much, much more simple to have them have similar uh, water potentials. So that, we can cross that one off. The two other options are that plants in the field are responding in a similar way genetically as those in the greenhouse. They're just doing it at a, at a lower rate. They just acclimatize their conditions a little bit so that they're not responding extremely hard. They're just responding on a few genes, whereas those same genes are also differentially expressed in the greenhouse, just many, many other ones are as well. And then the last, and then the last hypothesis is that, and this would be the most concerning, that the responses are completely genetically different. Genes that cause differential expression in the field are completely different from those in the greenhouse. So we just intersect these three experiments, the shelter, the cylinder, and the greenhouse. And we find that if we just look at the shelter here, there are about 700 differentially expressed genes, 500 of which are also found in both the cylinder and the greenhouse. This is telling us that they're not independent genetic mechanisms for drought. It's just that there's a lot of other genes that are only expressed in these experiments, maybe fast soil drying uh, gene responses, but that all of these long-term drought genes, most of them are also found in these short-term droughts. There are some um, that are private to the shelter, but those weren't particularly enriched in um, annotations that we thought might be significant. But these are where all of these known drought responsive genes exist. Um, so leave it to say that in this experiment, we've shown that it really, as long as you're doing a, um, a thoughtful and highly replicated drought experiment, you can capture these genes that are very important for uh, regulation. The problem is that when you do these short-term droughts in the greenhouse, you're also capturing thousands and thousands of other genes that are not necessarily important for drought responses in the field. So it's something to consider. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking only about differential expression in the field, and I'm not going to be using expression analyses that were done in uh, the lab. So I'll switch gears now, and we were talking about, um, about uh, switchgrass. Now let's talk about Panicum hallii. So switchgrass has these two morphs, uh, lowlands that are, uh, sorry, uplands that are stress tolerant but grow slowly, and lowlands that grow fast but are not stress tolerant. Panicum hallii, the genetic uh, model for switchgrass, also has these, these two. Here are just two pictures of the same age plants. Um, the upland, slow-growing, stress-tolerant, and the lowland, fast-growing, stress-intolerant. So here I'm going to be comparing these two ecotypes, uplands and lowlands. So what we did first is sequence a whole bunch of Panicum hallii from across its native range, which is Texas, uh, New Mexico, and some of Arizona. It also gets into Mexico, but we couldn't get permits to do the work down there. Um, and what we found is that there's very, very strong population structure here. This is just a uh, neighbor joining tree, um, no, maximum likelihood tree of genetic similarity between um, all of these points colored up here. What you can see is that there's a lot of population structure, but that there's an extreme amount of population structure between these blue points and these red ones. This one here represents about 3.5 times this length branch. So these guys would actually be you know, out here. Um, 
And what we did is we said, okay, we want to understand the genetic differences between these uplands that are all in the warm colors and the lowlands that are in these blue, blue colors. And so we chose two genotypes, one that's sort of the basal to the lineage, to the root of uh, Panicum verbatim, and one out on the tip here. And we chose these not, cause, not just because they're contrasting in the tree, but also because they're actually very geographically proximate. So we thought maybe we were controlling for more um, neutral genetic variation between these. I think we were. So for all the comparisons, you'll, you'll hear this a lot for the next few minutes, HAL2 and FIL2 are these two genotypes. HAL2 is the upland genotype, and FIL2 is the lowland genotype. So what we did is we stressed these in the field with a wet, a wet treat, a dry treatment, and then a recovery from that dry treatment where we watered all of the plants. And I'm just going to call these wet and dry, but you can also think of them as drought and recovery. What we can see here is that again, HAL2 has this much steeper slope, indicating greater plasticity to drought and fill to, and, and potentially adaptive physiological response. And we wanted to understand what are the genes that cause these differences in slope, right? What are the genes that cause differential responses to drought? Well, we first just did RNA sequencing on HAL2 and FIL2 and, um, and looked at, essentially did what we did before with those volcano plots, but did it both in a recovery treatment where we compare HAL2 and FIL2 and in a drought treatment where we compare HAL2 and FIL2. The way to read this is each point, again, represents a gene and only the significantly differentially expressed genes are plotted here. Genes up here in, uh, in orange are constitutively different between HAL2 and FIL2. They're both different in the drought treatment and in the recovery treatment, and this is what a reaction norm plot would look like, that the FIL2 and the HAL2 are just always different regardless of the treatment. They're also these condi conditionally neutral um, genes that are differentially expressed in the case of blue here, only in the wet treatment. And in the dry treatment, they're not differentially expressed. They would look like this, but there's also many in red that are only differentially expressed in the drought treatment and not in the wet. And then there are these rank changing differentially expressed genes that are more lowly expressed in one genotype, in one treatment, and then that rank switches. Remember when I'm talking about that genotype by an in uh, environment interaction that drives local adaptation. This type of genotype by environment interaction at the gene expression level may be particularly important for dry, driving the trade-offs that lead to local adaptation. Uh, so, all right, so what are the genetic elements that can potentially lead to these differential responses at the gene expression level? In biology, we love categorizing things that are actually continuous. But in gene expression regulatory variation, there really are two distinct groups of genetic elements. Those that are local to, to a gene and affect only the expression of that gene. That's a cis regulatory element. Think about promoter sequences um, or repressors. Then there are also, and they, these can be identified by any number of these cis regulatory feedback loops that you might expect. <coughs> There's also trans-regulatory elements. These are distant elements that, um, that act on multiple genes, or at least one gene. So you can envision maybe a transcription factor that goes ahead and affects expression of many genes, or some other um, factor that affects expression. So these cis and trans-regulatory elements, they might just seem like uh, you know, esoteric um, naming conventions, but they actually have very significant impacts on the evolution of uh, gene expression regulatory variation. You may uh, know, uh, I guess, in quantitative genetics literature, we know that when you try and breed for a trait, the best selection, the best response to selection comes when that trait is very modular, when it only is affected by a few independent loci. But when loci affect many different traits, you actually get a constraint to adaptation. Imagine a case where you have a trait that leads to increased drought tolerance, but also uh, increased insect susceptibility. Uh, sorry, a locust that leads to, uh, evolves a, a allele that leads to 
increased drought tolerance, and increased susceptibility to insects. The next generation, if those, both of those loci go to all of the offspring, you won't be able to really select for drought tolerance because those plants will also be attacked by insects. But if those were each of those traits were affected by independent loci, then you would see recombination and some offspring would be both drought tolerant and insect resistant. And, some, and those could be selected for, and some offspring would be both susceptible to drought and susceptible to insects and you could select against those. It also works that way in natural selection. The reason that I'm saying this is because cis regulatory elements are modular. They affect a single gene, and that gene, who knows what that gene goes ahead and does, but the fact that it's affecting the regulation of a single gene means that it's more amenable to responding to natural selection. Whereas, whereas a trans regulatory factor affects, has this pleiotropic effect where it affects many, many different genes, and that those could all have <coughs> interfering effects and reduce response to selection. All said and done, what we expect is adaptive evolution here and neutral evolution in transregulatory elements. And that's not the rule because it certainly could be the case that a transcription factor comes along and does something great. And for sure we could see adaptive evolution to it. But on average, these should be more neutral in evolving and these should be more adaptive. So how can we test persist and transregulatory variation? We can use a technique called QTL mapping, in this case, gene expression QTL mapping, or eQTL mapping. So who here knows about QTL mapping? Who's ever done it or heard of it? Anyone? All right, so we're definitely gonna go through the details of it. So QTL mapping is essentially the association between phenotypic variation and genotypic variation. And in this case, we're using a population that is controlled. It's an experimental population with just two parents, which means there's three genotypes. The AA, the A little a heterozygote, and the little a little a. These are color-coded here as green, blue, and red. I'm sorry about the figure. This, what I'm showing here, is just one chromosome of Panicum hallii with these three genotypes indicated as the different colors. And you can see here are the 250 or so individuals we have and the 120 or so markers that we have on this chromosome. And you can see that it's a random association of, uh, genetic, of, of genotypes to individuals because the order of individuals here is just the order they came off of the sequencer. If there were a QTL, we might see an association between the order of the individuals in terms of their phenotype and the position of, of these genotypes. For example, if, there's, if we know there's a strong QTL on the top of chromosome three, this is what it might look like. Here, all of the red genotypes, this is homozygote one, are here having a low phenotypic value. All of the green genotypes have a high phenotypic value and the heterozygotes are in the middle. This is indicative of a very strong QTL. So it's a locus that explains the, where the genetic variation explains the phenotypic variation. And if we apply a statistic to this called a log score, we can see, and this is the nine chromosomes of Panicum hallii, we can see a large QTL on the top of chromosome three. This is what a QTL looks like. So that's just standard QTL mapping. That's the idea of it. The thing is that we also have an additional piece of information with, expression, with gene expression. We not only know the phenotype, but we know the physical location of the gene where that came from. In the case of this profile, this comes from a gene ABO3, abscisic acid overly sensitive 3, which exists physically on the top of chromosome 3 directly under this peak. This is a cis eQTL. This QTL is a genetic variant that affects expression of this gene in its physical place. But we can have more complex genetic networks driving uh, uh, gene expression. Um, oh, and by the way, we know that this gene has a number of non-synonymous variants and critically a lot of variants in the promoter of this gene between HAL2 and FIL2. But the, the genetic networks can be much more complicated. Take NRT1, which is a nit nitrate transporter in the guard cell. This lives on the, top, on the middle of chromosome 3, directly under this peak, a cis-EQTL. But there's also a peak on chromosome 3, 
That's a trans EQTL. Okay. So I hope I haven't bored you too much with how uh, gene, with gene expression QTL mapping works. Let's look at the actual results. So this is what all of the QTL look like, the expression QTL look like from our mapping population. The way to read this is this is the mapping position of the QTL. So there'd be like, a, this is where the peaks are. And this is the physical location of the gene. Anytime that there's a gene, a, a dot, that's a QTL. And anytime the dot is on the diagonal, that's a cis EQTL. Everything off of diagonal is trans. So for example, with that NRT1 gene that has this profile, we have a cis EQTL and a trans EQTL. All right, so what jumps out at you? I think the obvious thing, and actually it's not shown very well in this figure, is that there are a lot of cis EQTL, far, far more than there are trans. And that's really interesting. It shows that this HAL2 and FIL2 variety have evolved in large part due to local regulatory variants, like variants in the promoter region of these genes. But also, there's clearly a non-random associated placement of these trans EQTL. You can see pileups on the top of chromosome three, maybe even two of them, one on the bottom of chromosome seven, and even if you look at chromosome four, you can see these vertical lines, indicating that there are lots of QTL mapping to different positions in the genome. That's indicative of some sort of trans factor that's affecting the expression of many genes. If we look at this just as a sliding window of the density of trans factor, of transcription, or trans EQTL, excuse me, we get three very significant trans EQTL peaks. The foremost is this one on the top of chromosome three. Um, and I'll focus on that one. So now the idea is how can we define candidate genes for both the cis regulatory QTL and these trans regulatory hotspots. How can we do that? That's what the last part of the talk is about. We can do it by comparing the sequence variants underneath these genes. So there are many ways to find candidate genes underlying QTL. Um, the simplest way is to just look at the region, uh, find genes that exist in a QTL region and find the one that comes out as, your, as annotated as your favorite gene. This is how it's all, almost always done. You find a QTL region, you pull out the genes of interest, and you say, oh, it's probably this one. You can add a little bit to that, and you can add some sort of search for annotations or search for gene expression. For example, a few years ago, we were looking for a candidate gene for a QTL that existed right here. We looked at differential expression and we only found one that was significantly different. And we were able to follow that up and actually confirm that using uh, gene editing. But that's the first and simplest way. You can also model the genetic relationship between the phenotype and an intermediary phenotype. So for example, if you have a phenotype that's you know, uh, flowering time or whatever, and you have a, a gene that you think is uh, driving it, you can ask, is the expression of that gene associated with the phenotype? You can do this through a hierarchical model um, that we developed a few years ago. And we did that, that latter approach for, oh, sorry, one more thing. So to do any of this here, we need to um, have knowledge of the genetic, the DNA, and potentially transcript sequences of the parents of the population. So we, we developed de novo genomes for both FIL2 and HAL2. FIL2 is a little bit older. We use slightly older PAC bio sequence technology. We also use Molecular, which is a now defunct Illumina offshoot, a bunch of back clones, and a lot of Illumina sequencing. And what we got was a great <coughs> genome. Of the 500 megabase genome, we were able to assign it to 117 contexts with only a couple breaks. This is a very good genome. Like, already this genome is in the top six or seven plant genomes available. We did it, then we went ahead and did uh, how to this past year using new Illumina, new PAC biotechnology, and a new assembler. And it's a smaller genome, but we only got 15 contexts on two breaks. This is maybe the, in the top, top three plant genomes available right now in terms of its contiguity. Um, and if we compare it, this was all done by my colleague Jerry Jenkins. And we used, we were able to order markers and uh, use a tremendous amount of genetic uh, detail available um, 
and to produce these great genomes. Just to put this in context, Brachypodium, which is probably the best genome outside of Arabidopsis thaliana, um, has five contigs, one for each chromosome. Uh, HAL2 has 15 contigs, nine of the, uh, four of the, of the chromosomes are single contig, and the rest have two split at the centromere. Um, and you can see that our L50 is really high. All right, enough boring sequencing stats. What do these two genomes look like? So this is a circus plot where we have the HAL2 and the PIL2 chromosomes paired. So this is chromosome one, two, all the way to nine. In here, this is the gene density in blue and the repeat density in gray and brown. So you can see, just like maybe you don't know about grass genomes, actually, grass genomes have huge pericentromeric regions that do not recombine and are very gene poor. You can see these here around the centromeres, which are in red. Um, so we have these clear, obvious pericentromeric regions, but then these extremely gene-dense chromosome arms. The density of genes in these in these chromosome arms is close to or exceeds that of Arabidopsis thaliana, which is one of the densest genomes around. So it allows us, and there's also really high rates of recombination in these <coughs> chromosome arms. So it lets us find and capture um, the genes of interest a little bit more easily <coughs> because we can effectively ignore these pericentromeric regions. But the important thing to note here is that each of these curves represents a syntetic block of genes between the FIL2 genome and the HAL2 genome. Anytime you see arcs like this, that means that they're syntony. You look around here, there's nothing that's not syntetic. These two lines going across might draw your eye, but those are ancestral duplications. You can actually ignore them. So moral of the story is that HAL2 and FIL2 genomes, while diverged by over a million years, are almost entirely syntetic. Why does this matter? It matters because if we have a QTL, let's say, on the top of chromosome three here, we know that we have orthologous sequence in that region of FIL2, and we can extract the coordinates and focus on sequence differentiation between the two. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up pretty soon, I promise. Um, so we're able to look at these local cis elements and these distant trans elements. We have some hypotheses, right, that these cis local elements should be in the promoter or the coding sequence, and these trans elements are likely transcription factors. So we found it candidate genes for this QTL hotspot using that hierarchical modeling approach that I talked about previously. What we find is that the genes that map, that have QTL that map to this region, this is what their expression looks like for FIL2, the F1, and the HAL2. And you can see red meaning higher expression, blue meaning lower expression. You can see that most of the difference between the drought and the recovery treatments occur only in the FIL2 genotype. We know that this gene, ABO3, is a working transcription factor and that it responds only, it responds massively to drought, but only when it's knocked out. And we know that the FIL2 allele of ABO3 is null by our comparative genomics pipeline. Um, in fact, and here's the expression of FIL2 relative to HAL2, much, much lower. And it's qPCR, not, uh, not RNA-seq. So how about the patterns of cis and trans regulatory variations? So, so far, I really only talked about trans, but I mentioned previously that we thought that maybe cis regulatory variants would be under control of natural selection, maybe adapted, but that trans regulatory variants would not be. If we look at genes that have both cis and trans regulatory variants, like NRT1, and we compare the effect of the cis QTL and the trans QTL, what we see is a negative slope, both in the drought treatment and the recovery treatment, but more so in the drought treatment. What does this mean? Why are there all of these antagonistic effects where it's positive, or it's negative effect in the cis QTL, but positive in the trans QTL? What could be explaining that? Well, if we imagine that there's trans regulatory loci that are evolving neutrally or maladaptively, but that the ancestral state is favored, so stabilizing selection, then evolution of a trans factor should be countered by the opposite evolution of a cis factor. That's called comp compensatory evolution, and this is very strong evidence for it. So we can say that we think that a lot of the cis variants that we see are compensating for trans variants that are neutral or maladaptive. 
But what is it uh, underneath those uh, cis QTL that's actually driving it? To understand that, we needed to develop a comparative genomics pipeline that is informed by sentinel. I'm going to skip through this because it probably isn't very interesting to you. But essentially what we can do is for any two genomes, what, um, in this case it's an outgroup and HAL2, we can look at the synteny between the genomes, so this is the position uh, in one genome and the position in the other, and build syntetic blocks, and then extract the sequence from those blocks and do uh, multiple sequence alignments. So for example, it would look like this for chromosome four. <laughs> um, this is a pipeline that we have in-house that we haven't published yet. But essentially, imagine that a QTL is somewhere in this region. We can find that specific location in the other genome and pull it out and look through comparative genomics. So we did that in, um, in HAL2 and FIL2 and compared the odds of CDS, so coding variants, significantly like functional coding variants, like non-synonymous variants, and transcription factor binding affinity variants, so variants in the promoter that affect the binding of transcription factor. And we compared the, Q, the genes that have a cis QTL to all of the genes that don't have a QTL. And so what, the way to read this table is that for this cell here, there's 1.5 times more transcription factor binding affinity evolution. So transcription factor target sites have evolved 1.5 times faster at genes with an additive cis QTL than genes without a QTL. Alternatively, this here shows that genes that have uh, only trans QTL have actually less evolved differences at transcription factor sites. So this um, tells us basically if you only have a trans EQTL, you have to keep your promoter similar to the ancestral state. That makes sense because it's probably a transcription factor that needs to bind onto something. And that at cis, if you have a cis regulatory variant, it's almost always driven by transcription factor binding regulatory variants and much less likely to be driven by coding sequences. Um, if we look at genes that respond differentially to drought, we see the same pattern, but more exaggerated. There's even more evolution of uh, transcription factor binding affinity in these drought responsive QTL, and even less, uh, even more conservation in uh, these trans QTL. So with that, I'll conclude by just sort of wrapping up. What I've talked about today are ways that we can study drought adaptation from both the physiological and molecular perspective um, and highlighting the value of doing work in the field. And through eQTL mapping, demonstrated that trans regulatory variation is really important and that actually cis and trans interactions and genetic networks may counteract each other through stabilizing selection to maintain uh, the ancestral state, at least in this experiment. So before I go, I want to um, discuss quickly the, the collaborators that um, helped make this project possible. Obviously a huge sequencing and field effort. Um, this is done by my collaborators at the University of Texas, Michigan State, Missouri, and a number of other areas. The genome sequencing is funded and organized by Kerry Berry and Dan Roxar at the Joint Genome Institute. He was the JGI crew. And then our group at Hudson Alpha actually did the sequencing and the bioinformatics. Here we are. And um, I'll just go ahead and plug the Joint Genome Institute. You don't have to only be working in biofuels for the Joint Genome Institute to be able to help fund your research. They do work in fungal genomics as well as plant genomics, microbial metagenomics. Um, they do DNA synthesis and um, metabolites. And um, so, for example, the last four publications to come out of the JGI, they built a sphagnum moss genome, they looked at bacterial cell signaling, they built a Carimbia genome, and looked at pan genomes in Archaea. So there's a huge diversity of, of work that we do. And if you're interested in working with us, there almost always are calls for proposals. And I'll show those in a second. Um, and so, for example, oh, get on your horse. There's a proposal due today um, for up to 2 million CPU hours to do bioinformatics. Um, and I think this is this call for proposals is, is basically um, using this computational resource, this huge supercomputer called NERSE, to do your analyses. So you already have to have data in hand. 
but let's say you wanted to do some complex model that took days on your computer, you could um, write a grant proposal to get funding to do it on here. And they're actually fairly easy to get. So I highly recommend checking out the JGI or um, contacting me if you're interested at all. Um, and then I'll end by saying, in case you're interested, we do have a number of conferences coming up. Um, one for the user meeting, um, this, is, this spans all aspects of the JGI, and then CROPS is just looking at plant genomes. Thank you very much. Time for questions, or should we try and keep? So uh, we do have time for questions. Christine emailed during your talk, and I, apparently lunch is not coming. So my apologies for that. I'm not sure what the error is, um, but I'll work with Christine to correct that. We're batting uh, a good batting average for baseball with that for lunch. Uh, so uh, with that said, yeah, there are uh, there are questions, uh, time for questions for John. <coughs> yeah. So. My understanding is that it's, it's not trivial to um, document transcription factor finding sites in your genome. Right. So I'm curious how you, so you have these tables where you have categorized these new transcription factor finding sites. Like how, where did those data come from and how complete is that? Is that uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So what we did here in this particular study is we extracted the promoter re regions, which you can predict using computational approaches. We didn't actually do any biology to do it. We pull out the sequences. There's a list of, um, of position, positional frequency matrices that we know that different transcription factors bind to. And you search for those. And then you ask, just like you would annotate any other genome, what is the difference between those sequences? Has that affinity been lost? You basically, for a number, I think like 300 transcription factor target sites, you model how well that transcription factor binds to it. Now that's kind of a quick and dirty way to do it, but what we're doing now is we have ATAC seq, so we're looking for open chromatin. So now we know, all right, here are actual putative binding sites. Then we model our own binding sequences based on the sites that are open and ask about the evolution of those. And so that's going to be the next paper is about the, the actual regulatory variants. So uh, I'm wondering um, if you could maybe um, explain a little more about, so early on in your talk, you were talking about how the difference between um, the different types of experiments. And i um, just wondering why do you think there would be more genes differentially expressed in those small pots than in the field? Uh, is there like more sources of stress or what's going on there? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. It's actually the focus of an entire paper. Um, the the reason behind it is not I'm not 100% sure, but I think a large amount of so you're asking basically why are there so many <coughs> genes out here and so few genes here? Um, I, a lot of these genes come out as like heat shock proteins and generic stress genes. These plants have been droughted very quickly over the course of two or four weeks. And, and these plants, sorry, have been stressed very quickly. And these are sitting out in the field having longer time to acclimate to the stress. So it's not super surprising that we're seeing a lot of generic stress. Oh my God, I'm gonna die, what do I do? Type of gene responses in addition to the drought, the drought specific ones. As for why there's so few differentially expressed in the shelter, I. I think that it has to do is just the converse of that, that these plants have come to equilibrium with their environments and now are just maintaining an adaptive response instead of trying to ramp up a response, which is what might be happening out here. So what's sort of the takeaway from that? That those other I mean, is there a solution to that, a way to get around that problem? Well the, the you're, you're wanting to like you said that these were this was a good learning opportunity. These short term experiments that you can have students do, but then um, you can see that there's a big difference in outcomes. Yeah. So I think one of the main take home messages is to not be afraid to do things in the field. Um, so if you have the resources and the time 
you should try and do things in the field. It's actually not so hard if you don't have to build huge rain exclusion shelters. Um, but the other take home is that you're still doing a good job of modeling the genes that are differentially expressed. And you're getting, in the greenhouse, you're getting you know, 70% of all of the differentially expressed genes in the, in the field, but you're also getting all this chaff. So the, if you're just doing enrichment tests on, okay, I want to find the genes that are differentially expressed and all you have is the greenhouse, you're going to say, oh, wow, they're all of these heat shock proteins that must be really important. But actually those are maybe not as important. So it should be basically to take your enrichment tests and your total number of genes that are responding throughout in these short-term experiments with a little bit of a grain of salt. I have a question not being a geneticist at all, mm -hmm. um, but these gene expression things are always really intriguing, and I wonder about how time and measurement of the expression in tissue that you choose influences something like this. So time is yeah. transplant, and then which parts of the organism are you looking at? So for sure, the root gene expression will be more different than the, than the shoot gene expression within one plant than across all grasses. If you look at just leaf expression, there's very there's lower expression differences than that between maize and wheat than there is between the root and shoot of, of a maize plant, for example. So yes, tissue matters a ton. What I've done here is just the leaf. Um, and that's really important. In terms of time since transplant, not that important unless it's really near transplant. In this case, all of these are months out, so it's not an issue. But time of day is critical. So um, the, site, the circadian rhythm, especially in plants and especially in leaves, since they have to ramp up all of their photosynthesis apparatus in the day, is massive between day and night. So we make sure in all of these experiments to do our sampling within 90 minutes from start to end. Plus, we categorize the time, the order that those samples were taken, and we fit our gene expression models, we fit that as a covariate in the model, the time that it was taken assuming additive changes across the experiment. What about the time since treatment? Yeah, that's um, So the time since treatment here, the treatments have all happened long before. So I'm saying that it's, so in this shelter here, the treatments are, con oh sorry, the treatments are constantly happening. The dry treatments are getting less water all the time than the wet treatments. Um, in terms of time since watering was applied, watering was always applied at um, pre-dawn. So, and one treatment is just getting less than the other. In terms of the shelter and the cylinders, um, it's the same, essentially the same thing. Um, a little, it's, this experiment is a little different, but yeah. So I was asking kind of since transplant, it's kind of an offshoot similar to what you were just asking because um, you use the term, or you use the explanation that in the shelter in the field, they come into equilibrium with their environment. Mm -hmm. So that would suggest then that there wasn't time enough for these other I things. see. I meant, when I meant equilibrium, I meant from a gene expression regulatory. Uh, so it takes a lot of work for a plant to respond to drought. It has to have fewer stomata. The stomata have to clo it has to build all more roots. But if the plant has already built all of those roots and has already produced leaves with less stomata on them, then it wouldn't have to ramp up these uh, responses to do that, essentially. So that, that changing and reconstituting of a leaf, for example, yep. can happen over time at an organism at an individual level. And so presumably that would happen at some similar rate, mm -hmm. plus or minus something. Yep. So it doesn't time since transplant then have an influence potentially on what you see in the plant? Yeah, so um, for sure. And I guess the context that I, I missed presenting here is that the shelter and the, cil uh, the cylinder and the greenhouse experiments are shorter term. Yeah. And so that is one of the things that's driving this. And we so you're, explicitly you're tested. Earlier in the process than you are in the process. Absolutely. But the, the reason that we chose to do it that way is because these greenhouse experiments are never on, oh, I get that. on long, long. I really like this plot. Uh, yeah, I get why I might have done that and make that difference. Yeah. I'm not. It's not clear to me that they're sort of sampled along that continuum yeah. to coming to equilibrium, whatever you want to call it, yeah. at the same point. Yeah, so the optimal experiment would have been, paper, right? well, it, it was in some ways, but the optimal experiment would have two other experiments. One in the greenhouse where we applied the same exact treatment <coughs> as the shelter, 
where it's like long term. But the problem is then the plants have to be this big and it's no longer this small scale experiment. Has anybody done it as a time series where you can sort of see those initial heat shocks turn on and turn back off so you understand that time series? Um, it's been done in the Rabidopsis in these types of experiments. Problem is that I think that these, these greenhouse, these small pot experiments, I think they um, are, the plant is not only just responding to the stress, it's also responding to being in a tiny space. So it's and there's, gone. Yeah, there's just stuff happening with a plant having constrained roots. I mean, you could imagine uh, that an owl being trapped in a cage versus one flying out in the field would have very different uh, behavior and probably different uh, yeah, expression. Stress stress yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I think there are lots of studies that say, okay, we start to stress and then every hour we measure it for sure. And or every morning, however you want to do the experiment, and they're very interesting, but uh, it, it's kind of not what we were trying to do. Sure. So can you just follow up on that real quickly? In the greenhouse, you ought to be able to subtract that out as sort of the baseline, right? So if you have controls in the greenhouse, you know, treat treated plants in the greenhouse, but the one is stressed, one is not. If it's response to the greenhouse. We should be able to compare the control in the greenhouse to the control in the field. That's what well, you're trying I mean, to say. That, yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, you know, we, I think we, in one of the iterations of the paper, we did that, and then, it, and then we gave up on it for one reason or another. It actually would be a great thing to revisit, to ask, what are the greenhouse-specific genes? I think, and then to cull those out of this and ask what we see. It would be very interesting. But in, in these experiments, in these numbers here, it is just a within experiment. Um, and it's partially, the reason partially we didn't do it now that I'm remembering, is that there were slightly different library prep steps and we didn't want to bias our experiments by that. Yeah. How, you said this was three prime text. So you're presumably looking Yeah, yeah, we have about 38,000, I think, that were expressed. This is a polyploid. Yeah. Um, but, or maybe it wasn't that many. Across the whole experiment, it was about 38,000. Um, yeah, um, but not outside of the realm of what you see in drought experiments. So um, actually it's, I mean, Arabidopsis, we usually get like 12 or 13,000 totally exp total expressed genes. And of those, in some of our experiments, we're seeing eight or 9,000 that are differentially expressed in Europe. Because the, the expression is so the, the experiment is so strong. But you're absolutely right. We were expecting these numbers to all be, you know, divide that by a factor of 10. That's kind of what I was going into it expecting. Especially because three prime tag operates on the tail of the RNA-seq molecule, and, or the RNA molecule. And that's the part that's least likely to be conserved, whether it's through, uh, splicing or just evolution and um, so we we're expecting to have already sampled more conserved genes which likely aren't responding to drought as much but no oh the other other thing is we have huge replication here I have like 30 plants per treatment you know so that might also be a reason that we're seeing more signal You guys did great without lunch. <laughs> Getting off to sleep. All right, if there's no other questions for John, let's thank him one more time. Oh, and by the way, I posted a bunch of stuff on the Slack page. Yes, thank you for doing that. If you guys haven't joined in, the flyers have the link for that, and there's uh, at least two or three papers there. I didn't actually put any papers on it. I can do that, but I put oh. links to these proposals and to our organizations in my email, and feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So I think you're meeting uh, with Chris next. Great. Do you have a sandwich? If I'm one up there. They're available. Yeah, I'll we'll grab one. And uh, I'll grab one. Thank you. Appreciate it. Unless, Chris, do you also need lunch? Uh, okay, we can also just go get lunch. That works better. What do you guys want to do? I don't mind grabbing one and. All right, why don't you just do that? We'll figure it out. Okay. Um, we'll just go back to Chris's. Yeah. Oh, really? They're bad. Well, hey, we're going to the progress report. That's all right. Well, that's great. That's not so good.
Oh wait, wait. <laughs> is that not the schedule after you? Well, I have it on an email. I forget. Yeah, you're. I think. Greg, uh, after you. Yeah. And then, yeah. I'm going to two, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk to you then. Yeah, enjoy the time. Thank you. Um,